Hi everyone on Zoom. Yeah, can do. Pray for Claire. Well, just thank you for Claire. Just thank you for watching Carrie's view, and we do just pray that, um, as she kicks this series off that actually we use it to bring fresh revelation of your love and your care for each and every one of us in this room. Amen. Amen. Brilliant. Okay, can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah. Good. Cool. Um. So as we've been saying, we've been we're oh God. <laughs> bye bye. We're going to start this little series on dreams. And the reason why, really, is because dreams are fascinating, aren't they? And um, I, there, uh, there has felt recently in our little community of people a bit of a flurry of interesting dreams. And it's several time, times it sort of prompted us to sort of say, do you think we should sort of you know, talk about dreams. Should we have a little time of studying them? Shall we do a sermon series on dreams? Because, you know, they do interest us, don't they? Put your hand up if in this room and on Zoom, if you have ever had a, a dream that is more than just one of those obviously random, just series of things that you kind of know, just you processing your mad thought life. So, but one that has felt to have a bit of something about it that you've thought, does it mean something? Put your hand up if you've, right, most people in the room and um, probably in history, dreams are something whether different religions, different groups of people, different phases of history, it's kind of like a thread, isn't it? That runs throughout history where the dreamers, people have these dreams and they wonder, do they mean something? And um, Christians too. And Jewish people, pre-Christian, but the sort of history of the Jewish race in their relationship with God, there's been, you know, there have been dreams that have come up and sometimes they've been obvious, the answer. Like, do they mean something? Yes, they do. This is going to happen. Um, but other times, really full of mystery. But they do kind of raise our sort of in interest and um, to be a dreams interpreter expert. Um, and there are people in this room who, who would have given themselves, you know, to the study of dreams and tried to work out, you know, how, how you do try and understand dreams. So there are probably people in this room who really have got some skill in that and have pursued it a bit. Um, but I would say that in my life, I've definitely had quite a few, a handful or so of dreams where I felt like um, my reality, my sort of material reality has crossed over into some spiritual dimension in a dream. And it's felt like I'm touching something otherworldly. Now, last week when I was starting to think about um, this subject, um, I woke up on Saturday morning and often on Saturday morning, we have a cup of coffee in bed <laughs> instead of sort of getting up and going to work and all that sort of thing. In fact, I have a cup of coffee in bed every, every day, but Greg usually just disappears. But we, and Greg sort of said, oh, are you gonna make the coffee? And at that moment, I just didn't want to make him a cup of coffee because I was feeling quite cross with him because I just finished a dream. And in this dream, he'd just been so exasperating. Basically, I can't imagine it. no, I know if you know Greg, you will not relate to this at all, this dream, but you know, basically in the dream, we had to go somewhere. It involved a vintage car. That is our life. There's vintage cars, all our sons have got them, it's endless. And um, it involved this vintage car, I think it was an old Ford Anglia. <laughs> the interpreters are going to be thinking, what the heck is this about? And we had to go somewhere, and you could just drive like a normal route round the streets to get to this place. But Greg didn't want to do that because he wanted to go for a swim at the same time. And so 
he was saying, I want to go for a swim. And, and, I was, and I was like, well, we just got to go there and drive this thing. He said, no, I want to go for a swim. And suddenly we found ourselves driving at full speed into a swimming pool in the car. And there we were sitting in the swimming pool and Greg trying to explain to me, it's fine, we're just doing both at the same time. We're going to go for a swim, but we're going to where we need to go. This vintage car is now in the swimming pool. We weren't drowning. And he was saying to me really elaborate sort of explanation of how all you've got to do Claire is you've got to get out and lift the front end of the car up on the side <laughs> and I'll lift the back and we'll push it out the swing and we'll go out through that window and literally all of this is sort of unfolding <laughs> well it kind of has some overlaps until I, and anyway as as I woke up just as we were trying to push the car through this window and I was just being so irritated and I was in my dream I was like always make me do these really complicated things and why do you have to make it so hard and why can't you just leave it about the swimming anyway so <laughs> now i'm sure the interpreters would have a field day <laughs> and then greg said do you want to make the coffee and i was like no i don't want to make the coffee and then i had to sort of calm down a little bit so that was you know what is going on in a dream like that is that a kind of you know well let's let's not go any further with that <laughs> but sometimes our dreams do just come out of random sort of uh, randomness of our thought life don't they but um and you know if you look at the science books basically um the here's a little definition of a dream from the science books neural activity in the primary sensory areas of the neocortex produces an impression of sensory perception and the resulting random imagery and sensations are woven together to create a complex multi-sensory hallucination. So that's the, you know, that is the sort of um, the, the biblical, the, the sort of scientific version of what a dream is. They don't mean anything. They're just a load of random images. They're woven together. It's just one big hallucination. Whereas in the Bible, um, the Bible often mentions dreams. Here's a little... Um, definition of a dream from the book of Job and in this in this book uh, he says for God does speak now one way and another through though no one really perceives it in a dream in a vision of the night when deep sleep falls on people as they slumber in their beds he may speak into their ears and terrify them with warnings to turn them from wrongdoing and keep them from pride to preserve them from the pit and their lives from perishing by the sword this speaker believes that God sometimes intrudes into your brain at night to speak to you with a message. What I feel is that there's something about dreams that remind us that we are not just completely material objects living in a material world. Our flesh life like the bible calls it your flesh life which is linked to the world and the way that you interact with material things overlaps into this spiritual zone where you have got a part of your life and your your mind your imagination what the bible tells us is your spirit and your spiritual life that there's this overlap and in this realm there is a possibility of the two things coming together you know that God could speak into this material person in this strange way and I suppose the thing I want to say to you is have you noticed how hard it is sometimes to keep a spiritual perspective going in your life you know if you were to um, imagine that you you could see a spectrum <laughs> Um, the material world through to the spiritual and I was to say to you how spiritual are you by habit you know like in your daily life making your decisions the things that you want to do you know, the things that you're concerned with how often are you spiritual or how often are you more material I've got to do this I've got to do that you know I've got to go there do you pray about every decision when you cross the road do you pray beforehand when you chew what goes in your sandwiches in the morning is that a spiritual decision for you or is it mainly material and sort of earthly you know where's your spiritual bit of your life you I'm asking you to assess yourself you know is it all very compartmentalized well I'm in spiritual mode now we're in church but when I go out the door you know to be honest I forget all about it and 
you know, I struggle to remind myself. So, you know, I forget God. You know, honestly, I'm not asking you to tell anyone, but where is it? You know, you can almost sort of know that the slider on that spectrum sometimes is really and truly right down at the bottom, isn't it? And there are times in our lives when it's hard to be spiritual and we feel a bit like distant from God. And there are other times when you feel, oh my goodness, I'm in touch. And that sort of slider goes up and down. Where is it at right now? Don't tell anyone, but imagine it in your mind. Where's the slider? In the middle? Slightly up on the middle, slightly down? But what we really want to do in this series is we want to recognize that you are a spiritual creature. You're inhabiting a material world, a flesh world. <laughs> and there is a bit of a tension between those two things. And maybe you're somebody who's exploring that tension. You're sort, you're sort of thinking, you know, is there more to my spiritual side than I have thought there was? You know, you hear a story like Cara just told. You think, some, some people might think, wow. Is that a way to lead a life? To go to a place and look at, think like that and be expecting that sort of thing and to be trying to understand stuff? Is that what it's supposed to look like? And some of you might never, ever think about that sort of thing. But what we want to do in this series is recognize that somehow in our dreams, it has this sense of a bit of an alert, like, oh, you are more than just flesh and you are more than just um, you know, somebody who's making decisions, that there's something spiritual going on. And we want to keep our heads in this series. I'm just painting a big picture. We don't want to become a sort of hotbed of dream, uh, constant dream analysis, this symbol, that symbol, this means that. We're not necessarily in this series seeking for everybody to be constantly obsessing about their dreams, but we do want to encourage you to think about them a little bit for a season, maybe do things like write stuff down and ask some questions and ask some questions about how would one go about interpreting a dream in a way that maybe the Bible would um, approve of? Because there's loads of ways of inter interpreting dreams that have nothing to do with the Bible. And in fact, if you Google it, you can see a list of things that are, you know, quite interesting and confusing. So I went, um, <laughs> went on, you know, a list of sort of in how to interpret your dreams. And I ended up on this way. Well, you can I ended up all over the place, but sort of talking about cats and dogs. And it was saying cats basically can mean, uh, there's a slide for it, I can't remember what it actually said. Cats can mean, um, what is, read it to me. Let me see if I can see it. Next one. Next one. Next one. Cats can mean evil spirits or comforting. Is that helpful? Dogs can mean man's best friend or unbelievers. I mean, you know, basically what this person, this list of things is just things they've thought it feels like over the years. So basically interpreting dreams is not necessary. I personally, now some people disagree with me and I don't mind if you disagree with me and let's talk about it. I am not 100% on board with a list of this always means that in a dream. So if an eagle turns up, it's always the prophetic. Or if a car turns up, it's always your ministry. I don't know what happened to our ministry in that dream because it was in a swimming pool. But... I'm not 100% on board with that, but some people might say, actually, I am, and come, yeah, let's talk about it. So, so, so in this little series, we're going to go with, through some of the dreams in the Bible, and we're going to use them as a launch pad to try and ex um, understand a little bit more about dreams. There's only 21 dreams in the Bible that are recorded. Now, sometimes it feels like there's loads of them, because we hear about Daniel and Joseph, but there's only 21, and here they are. Let's have that slide, the one before. And um, in so, we, sorry, Nick, oh, we're going to be wonderful. That here are the 21 dreams in the Bible, but, um, but we're going to whiz through all of these, but we won't go into all of them there. So, we start Abraham. The very first dream that's recorded in the Bible is, comes to a guy called Abimelech. Abimelech is a king who is. 
Um, Abraham is passing through his territory. Abraham has passed his wife off as his sister because he knows she's really beautiful and he doesn't want to cause controversy. So um, he doesn't want to be killed basically so that somebody can take his wife. The king takes a fancy to his wife and then God appears to the king in a dream and says, don't fall for her, she's already married. That's the very first dream that happens in the Bible. And then two or three more happen in the life of Abraham and his grandsons. Next week, Doug's going to talk about Jacob and Jacob's ladder, a sort of mad, mystical dream. Then um, we've got Gideon and the flying bread. That's what we're going to look at today. <laughs> Solomon has a dream from God where he offers him some stuff. Daniel has some really wacky dreams, and uh, we'll go there soon. Joseph, um, and then, oh, there's two Josephs. And so basically, and then the very last dream that's really recorded in the Bible that's a proper bona fide dream is Pilate's wife who warns Pilate of killing Jesus and then they just seem to disappear so there's a bit of an overlap with visions and you know some people sort of you know like what is a vision what is a dream but basically the actual dreams in the bible those are all of them so we're going to use them as a bit of a launch pad to go through okay so we're going to look at one particular one today which is Gideon and the flying bread okay and I'm just going to say two or three things about this dream as a way of helping us, encouraging us to be open to God speaking to us, maybe through our dreams, and how do we navigate that weird thing where this tension between our material world and the spiritual world and the fact that we don't really understand it a lot of the time. So let's read this little story. So um, this comes, this is a dream that actually doesn't come to Gideon himself, who is the main protagonist in this story, but he hears about it and it has a profound effect on what happens in this particular time. So um, let's just start here and we'll go back to the beginning later. So this is um, in the book of Judges. Now, the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. It's talking to Gideon. And during that night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up and go down against the camp because I'm going to give it into your hands. If you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they're saying. And afterwards, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So this is a time of great war and tribal warring and trying to get territory in the life in the sort of era of Israel it's about a thousand BC and they're living in in Israel and but there's constant stress and try little tribal wars as they sort of try and settle in the land of Israel and Gideon at this point is leading them he's a warrior but he's a judge and he's leading them and this, they're a bit of a motley crew, to be honest. The Israelites, they're living in caves at the moment because they're terrified. They've been driven off any land that they had won in their previous battles, and they've ended up living in caves, and they're farming the land. But every time there's a harvest, the local tribes come and steal their harvest, and it's stressful. <laughs> so this is what's happening. So God is saying to Gideon, I want you to move that camp of people away and have the land that I've given you. Um, but I know you're going to be a bit scared, so go down to their camp and listen to what they're saying. So down Gideon goes with his servant, and they go to the outpost of the camp, and the Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern people have settled in the valley, thick as locusts. That's a bit terrifying for them. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. When Gideon arrived, there was a man telling a dream to his comrade. And he said, this man was saying, I had a dream. And in it, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so hard that it fell. It turned upside down and the tent collapsed. And his comrade, so Gideon's listening to this through the wall of the tent. Comrade answered, this is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. And into his hand, God has given Midian and all the army. 
And when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. And then he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Get up, for the Lord has given the army of Midian into your hands. So here is Gideon the warrior with an, you know, a terrifying task on his hand because the, these Midianites were so numerous, they filled the valley all around them and they looked like a terrifying sight. And Gideon has been said, told by God, you can have your land back. You just need to go against this massive army, which far outnumbers you. And I know you're scared. So go down and listen to what is being said in the camp. And he overhears this dream. And the, the dream is by two Midianite soldiers. So here's, here's a couple of things. One thing is the problem with dreams is that they're very confusing and they just land in your brain in the middle of the night or at some point in the night in your REM sleep probably and they just land there and then you wake up in the morning you've got all this stuff and um, it might feel like it's got some meaning but it, it's always in the middle of a life where it's rarely that you are basically on a dreams course and you go to the dreams course, you've had all the interpretations ready, you've got your notebooks ready and you lie down to sleep and then this dream comes and hey presto, you're ready to interpret it. It's not like that, is it? Because your life is being led with all of the things that happen in your life and suddenly this thing pops into your brain and you, it feels like it might have some meaning, but you don't really know what it is. And it's just like that for these guys here. They're not looking to know what dreams mean. He's just had this dream in the middle of a battle ground where there's this pressure to get up and fight the next day. They're not spiritual people necessarily. They may have had their gods, but they're certainly not after the God of Israel. And they're not... Um, looking to develop their spiritual life. They're just doing the stuff that soldiers do, and it's a battle. And, you know, the context, the bigger picture is like I was saying, you know, these, these tribal wars that were happening, the Israelites post-slavery trying to establish their, themselves in an area where there's this constant toing and froing. And basically the Israelites, the Midianites knew that the Israelites were the underdogs. They were being driven into caves and they were on you know on the run really and so this man has this dream about a piece of about a loaf of bread falling out of the sky and he says it's a loaf of barley bread now barley bread was known to be it's kind of like the um the, the food for horses it was bread made out of horse food <laughs> and it was the cheapest form of flour that you could Yet and it was a hard, not very nice sort of horse cake type loaf of bread. So if you had, you know, if you were trying to interpret it on a very sort of sort of standard way, you know, this, you know, this piece of bread coming down would have been kind of, I don't know, maybe it'd be like a Tesco white slice loaf. It wasn't your artisan lovely sort. Of, it was like it's just a cheap, horrible bit of bread. Sorry if you like that sort of bread. And it falls out of the sky, and the person saying it would have known it was you know, it was a symbolic for a cheap piece of bread. So this, this first of all, there's three, three people in this little dream interpretation. The man who had the dream, and he just has this dream about this cheap loaf of bread. And, you know, the Israelites have been reduced to this sort of mangy, starving army with no natural resources, and this bread sort of symbolizes it, and it comes to this man under great pressure. And God speaks to... You know, God often speaks in the Bible to people who don't know him. And that's quite an interesting thing. So, you know, the fact, that, the fact is that it's not just spiritual people that get dreams. <laughs> so the fact that you get a dream that looks a bit spiritual, feels like it has meaning, doesn't mean any level of maturity in you or me. So, because the fact is that human beings can get dreams, and in this particular case, this is not a highly spiritual person that's really been looking into it. It's just a person, and this thing comes into his life. And I just ask you the question, you know, what, in, what's your sort of army camp situation, your, the pressures that you're in at the moment? What is the context into which God has got to, if he wants to speak to you, how easy is it for him to get through to you? 
because the pressures of your life and the things that you're experiencing, how spiritual you are feeling, and the pressure of your material flesh life, the things that tether you to the earth and consume you and worry you and use up all your energy, all of those things are present when God's trying to speak to you. And sometimes I think the challenge for us is really hard for us to hear God in the pressure of our normal everyday life because our spirits are consumed with just trying to cope and manage normal life. Who has felt the tension in this last six months, the COVID time, if you like, of trying to sort of get a sense of what God is saying and feeling like what on earth is going on? Put your hand up if you feel like it's been actually quite hard to get a sense of what God is doing because the, the, the messages from culture and society and the difficulties that we're experiencing, they actually can dampen our sense of connection to God and our sense of hope sometimes. And so that is a reality that we're, we're all living with. And if you, I just leave the question with that point that if you're somebody who wants to hear God, how, how easy is it for him to get through your fears and the things that consume you? And are you making space for him to, to speak to you? Do you ask him to speak to you? You know, we're going to hear at the very end of this a bit, bit of a thing from Laura, who's a good friend of Love Bristol, who, who often hears from God in dreams. And she's made a bit of a practice of hearing from God in dreams. And she, she's been, she basically has actually invited God to do that. And I, I just want to say that to you at the beginning of this series. Why don't you do that? Why don't you say, God, I would like, in the middle of all of this that we're going through, I would like to hear your voice. And I'd like to hear your voice in the night. One of my favorite quotes is by a guy called Brother Lawrence, who was a 14th century monk. And he thought a lot about how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. And he said this thing, he said, those who are in the Holy Spirit go forward even in their sleep. Those who are in the Holy Spirit go forward even in their sleep. Have you given your nights to God recently? And said, you know what? When I'm asleep, I'd love for you to speak. I'd love to hear your voice. And I think if you do that, God can sometimes get through. And God can get through to a Midianite soldier who doesn't know him. Second person in this little trio, this trio of people involved in this dream, is the interpreter. So this other unknown soldier, we only hear his voice through the tent wall. And he gives an interpretation. And the interpretation is fascinating because it's totally correct. Now, this is not somebody who's tuning into the Holy Spirit, who knows God and knows how things work, knew. He heard this dream and he knew what it was saying. It's a correct interpretation. And, you know, the word that, um, the word it says in the, in the text that Gideon hears the man interpreting it. And the word for interpretation that he, the text uses is the idea of smashing open a locked box and in it that's the word for interpretation smashing that's what it literally means so when you are trying to understand a dream this text said it's like smashing open to get the sort of content solving a mystery and this man who doesn't know god hasn't prayed he smashes open this box and he manages to get the meaning and what I think is really fascinating is that Gideon hears the interpretation and he is totally encouraged and excited by it, but the other people are terrified. So the first man, the first two men see their, their imminent death. What is going to come as a result of this thing is they see the, and their fear is totally correct, but Gideon Here's this interpretation, and he sees life and hope and a future. And one of the things that we want to do when we try to understand dreams is we want to understand the dreams in the light of the life and the hope that God wants to bring to the world and the people around you. It's one thing to have a dream and just be afraid, but are you someone who can bring hope and life 
through your interpretation. And that is what the Spirit does. So in, the, in, in Romans chapter 8, um, Paul says this. He says, the mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Is your mind governed by the spirit? Because if it is, as you start to look at these sort of mystical things, you will know how to bring life and peace. But if your mind is governed by the flesh, if it's tethered to the earth and all you can see is the fears and the pressures around you, the difficulties of life, then you won't be able to bring life in the way that you interpret dreams or anything be honest and I want to urge us really to welcome the Holy Spirit as we do this so that we can be people who bring life and hope and peace and I hope that that's something that you would be aspiring to because one of the things that we feel about this dream series one of the reasons why is not because we just want to be more spiritual no we're not really looking to become I'm a really mystical community that completely concentrating all the time on mystical experiences. What we're really looking for is to be a community of people who can say to the world, God loves you. God loves the world. That's the whole point of the church. It's not just with God in a holy huddle, having interesting spiritual experiences. God loves the world and he wants you to tell the world that God loves the world and that the point of life is to know God to be healed and to be full of life and bring others to know him. And so, you know, that is the point. I want to say that as we go into seven weeks on looking at dreams, we're not trying to just become experts at dream interpretation. We're trying to tell the world, God loves you. And so the mind brings life and peace. The first man, he seems to have The same event is more important than having a dream, having an interpretation is what you do with it. So I don't care how many spiritual dreams you've had in your life. It's not a badge of honour, it does be special. You know, other people, anyone can have a dream. And even if it doesn't really make you that special because, you know he's the one who's got the <laughs> get the response to something like that a spiritually absolute crunch point and Gideon you see here's this dream worship and there is this overlap where it is possible sometimes to get caught up into a worshipful place and have an encounter with God. And I, we would love you all, all of us, to have some encounters with God in dreams that catch you up into worship and re-envision you on, about who God is. There was a time at the, sort of early on in the life of Love Bristol where I, I had a dream that, um, that was kind of, was a worship dream. So in the dream, a few of us were in a church and everybody was sitting in rows and they were reading out of a book of liturgy and they were reading just as people do. You know, like if you go into an Anglican church and they read the liturgy every week, week by week, and they were reading it and they were sort of droning it out a little bit and they were just getting through the things. And we walked into this church and we sat down to try and start reading the liturgy with everyone. And there was this one particular line in this liturgy where the person next to me leaned over and said in a dream, oh, many, many years ago, when they read this line, they were caught up into worship in the air. And, um, but we don't believe that stuff happens anymore, but it's like a little historical interesting fact, you know, so it was like a few hundred years ago. And in this dream, I just had this burst of faith that it didn't have to just be history and that God could come and, and re 
sort of re catch people up into worship again. So in this dream, as this line came, we walked, we went, we were reading out this liturgy and suddenly we all read this line together. And at that point in my dream, I literally left my seat and I went up into the air. And I went up in the dream into a sort of, a sort of an opening in the ceiling of the building and I saw something heavenly. I can't really sort of say what it was, but I knew I was seeing something heavenly, heavenly. And in the dream, I found myself worshipping Jesus. I actually was calling him Yeshua, which is the Jewish name for Jesus, not something I ever do in normal life. But in this dream, I was worshipping Jesus and saying his name over and over again. And then I woke up in uh, bed and I heard my voice saying Yeshua, Yeshua over and over. And there was such a strong sense of the presence of Jesus in the room. I could hardly believe it. <laughs> and um, I was literally overwhelmed by the sense of this presence of Jesus. And, and it's like something I've been dreaming about took me into a place of touching something spiritual, Jesus. And then Jesus was suddenly in the actual room in the material realm. So, you know, and I probably have had two or three dreams like that in my life. They're not common dreams. And all that they say to me is that there is this overlap between our material world, our mind and our brain, and our spirit and our ability to reach God and for God to speak to us. And somewhere in, in our own brain and mind, is this realm of overlap where we can meet God and we can worship him and know him. And it's real. And in that moment when I woke up, you know, Jesus was as real as I was in the room. He filled the room and it was just a beautiful experience. And I just, again, I want to, I'm telling you that story not because it's a sign of anything, because I didn't do anything to make that. All that was happening in the context for that particular time was that we were really pushing into healing and we were really trying to be stretched in faith and really trying to go for something and I think it had something to do with it. So for Gideon, just back to Gideon for a second, you know what the backstory to all of this is that just before this has happened, God has said to Gideon, I'm going to give you this battle but your army is too big. Now there's millions of enemy soldiers if you like but God says to Gideon your army's too big you've got 22,000 people and I want to do it with less that must have been awful like an awful sort of idea for Gideon the warrior for God to say I want to shrink your army so he says tell everyone who's a bit scared go home he tells them and they end up with um, about 10,000 and God says to him it's still too big take them all down to the river anyone who kneels down and puts their face in the water to drink send them home and see who's left. And he's left with 300 to Gideon. Don't worry, I'm going to give this to you. He's shrunk his army from 22,000 to 300, and he's telling him to go. And he says, if you're scared, go down to the camp and listen through the wall of the tent and see what they're saying. And this dream is given to somebody who doesn't know God. The interpretation is given to somebody who doesn't know God. But Gideon, man of the spirit, he knows what to do and he's encouraged and he just worships and then the story actually plays out and you know they do they get the battle they don't even fight not a sword is raised as they go down to the camp and you can go and read the story it's in Judges 7 but there's something about the context into which God is wanting to speak in your life so for me in that time when I had that dream, there was this stretching of faith and Gideon has had his, stretch, his faith stretched and is trying to trust God. And I would just say to you, as we launch this series and we go into it and you're saying to God, to God, you know, I want to know you and I want to hear your voice in dreams. I just want to say to you that the setting that is best um, suited to hearing God and having those kind of visionary dreams and really understanding what they're meant to do and what you're meant to do with them is a life where you have a posture of faith and trust in God and you're open to him 
and you're leading a life that, where worship is at the centre of it. Because it's, en it's easy for anyone to have a dream, and it might even be easy for someone to interpret it, but it's not easy to know how to act in faith in response to a dream. And it, it could be even dangerous, and people have done things in response to dreams in history that have caused great violence and difficulty for people. But you want to be somebody that is a person of the spirit that God can use to bring life and peace, not death. So I just, I'm going to put that out there as the kind of the parameters through which we go through this little series. Are you somebody who wants to grow in faith and trust in God? Are you somebody who's welcoming the spirit, who God's worship at the center of your life? And if you are, then you can safely say, God, speak to me. Come, give me dreams. Help me interpret other people's dreams. Help me be somebody who sees the world through your eyes. And I think we could see, have some interesting times talking about dreams in the next few weeks. But um, can he trust you with his revelations? Are you that person whose life is open in that way? So that's my challenge to us. I'm just going to pray. And what I think I'd like, like to pray actually is, you don't have to agree with this prayer because it is a choice and it has to be a choice. But I'm going to pray on behalf of those of us who do want to hear God's voice in this time and really be able to be somebody who can be trusted with great revelation from God. And um, yeah, it's a serious prayer, really. Um, and then after that, I just want to, I'm going to show, every week we're going to do a little top tip from somebody who's a bit more experienced in dream interpretation, and we'll go around with various people, but this one is from Laura. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll hear from Laura, and then I think we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. So God, we just come to you now, and we, we recognize that you want to speak to us. You want to speak into our world. You want to speak to us and you want to find in us a trustworthy place in which to reveal the mysteries of heaven and a trustworthy heart and soul to give your revelations to. And I want to be that kind of person. And I recognize, God, that there's something from my side to do. And that is to worship and to trust and to be willing to step out in risk and show that trust and faith in that way. So, Father, I just, we're sorry for how material and how unspiritual we are a lot of the time. And we're sorry how it's hard sometimes for you to get through to us. And if we've missed what you've been saying, we're sorry, God. We pray, help us to hear your voice, open our ears to listen. And we just say that you are worthy of worship. And we put you at the center again. We say, we worship you. We honor you, Jesus. And we want to experience that kind of connection between us, our material world, and you. We want you to come, Holy Spirit, Jesus, and show yourself to us. I pray that everybody in this room would have an experience of you in a dream, even in this next season, where... They touch something of you, Jesus, and see your face and hear your voice again. So we say to you, yes, please would you speak to us and help us to hear your voice and help us to step out in trust. And we say we know that really, most of all, you want the world to know that you love it through us. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let's, let's just play um, Laura's little top tip. Hi, I'm Laura, and my top tip um, for listening to God through dreams uh, is that I often, before I go to sleep, will ask God to give me dreams, sometimes about something specific. Sometimes I'll just say, God, just really would love to hear from you tonight while I'm asleep. Please speak to me. 
through my dreams. Um, often I keep a little notebook next to my bed and in the middle of the night sometimes I've woken up after having a dream and I'll write it down. And um, the other thing just to say is actually the Holy Spirit never forgets. So sometimes I'll really like rest with a dream. I won't act on it immediately. I'll just let it settle. And um, the ones that are from God, often I can still remember them a few weeks later and God will speak to me through them. So my encouragement is sometimes you might not understand it straight away, but write it down, pray about it, rest with it and see what God reveals to you through it. Happy dreaming. on our own journey with him but also there's been quite a um, significant number of people across the world that have actually met Jesus in dreams and I think it's a really good thing to be um, like thinking oh actually are there people well, that I could be praying for that get a revelation of you in their dreams um, and uh, to be praying for people around us that maybe we think actually uh, these people are so far away from God I know I, I don't know what to say to them. We could just be praying for them to uh, to, to encounter him in their in their dream life. So, cool. okay, I think that's it. Thanks everyone for coming. We'll see you next week.